Hello everyone! In this video I'll show you my method for painting up a battalion of 15mm French Napoleonic Line Infantry. These infantry are in the 1812 Bardin uniform, and because they're in 15mm scale we get to strike a nice balance of depicting a lot of the detail of that uniform while also getting a massive number of them on the table. This is a small snapshot of a much larger Napoleonic French 15mm painting commission that I've taken on. So if you are interested in 15mm Napoleonic French models, I can do lots of other videos on other things such as light infantry battalions, old guard, young guard, and the like over the uh, coming weeks. Uh, should that be something that uh, seems to be interesting to the viewers of this channel. The process depicted here isn't quite speed painting, but it is meant to keep the painting time to a minimum since I do charge hourly, so I'm turning out as many of these as I possibly can in as little time as possible. To prepare metal miniatures for painting, there are some extra steps you might want to take. I've covered this before in other videos, but metal miniatures differ a little bit from plastic miniatures in that they tend to be cast and then sent right out to you, and may have demolding agents on them, so washing them is certainly important. I just do this with some warm soapy water, put them in a mug like so, stir them around every once in a while, just make sure you don't break them. Metal miniatures are also quite brittle, so stuff like the eagle there uh, is pretty fragile, or at least bendable, and you really don't want to break that kind of stuff off if you can avoid it. So be gentle, stir them around, and then when you're done, take them out, rinse them on under some clean water and lay them out somewhere to dry. You may want to do this with your plastic miniatures as well, but I certainly recommend it with metal models as it'll make sure that your primer and paint have good adhesion to the metal after the fact. Once they're dry, I'm going to organize them by company and I'm going to continue doing so for the rest of the painting process in order to keep my color schemes straight. To distinguish the flank companies from the center companies, the flank companies have large epaulets as you just saw and the center companies do not have such large pronounced epaulets. You should have two flank companies to four center companies, although in this case I'm replacing one of the center companies with a command stand, which consists of an officer representing the second company, and an eagle, and two drummers in the rear rank. That makes a full six company battalion of line infantry for Napoleonic gameplay. Using snippers and a file, I'm just going to go around and clean up some of the more pronounced mold lines, such as on the top of the shakos and underneath the models. The bottom needs to be smooth if we're going to glue them onto their bases cleanly. And also the little pieces of sprue that are sticking out from things like the plumes, the bayonets, and the top of the eagle. Next up, I want to mount them on painting stands to make painting them a little easier. I'm going to do this by company once again, again, so I don't get too confused while I'm painting them. If you want to see how I made these, the link is in the card now. Next up, I'm going to get the bases ready. The bases for these are going to be 3D printed, as has been the trend for a lot of my videos recently. I find that pretty convenient. I've 3D printed these little square bases, uh, per the customer's direction, with hollows in which I can place uh, the miniatures themselves. This helps hide the extra material at the bottom of the miniatures that would otherwise make them stand up, you know, what is the equivalent at their scale of six inches to a foot higher than the ground level. To add a little bit of texture to the bases, I put some super glue around the edges and then sprinkle some baking soda over top. The baking soda activates the super glue, forming a hard surface, and also adds some sandy texture. Next up, I prime everything with a zenithal highlight pattern of black and white Vallejo surface primers in order to add a little bit of contrast so that on these little models I can still see where all the cross belts and stuff are supposed to be. And I apply the same thing to the bases just because I have those primers out and they are good primers. For paints, I'm going to be using Vallejo's black and white to begin with. Next up, I'm going to be using some metallics later on in the project. That's Vallejo's gunmetal and bronze. Vallejo's royal blue and royal purple for uniforms and for plumes. Vallejo's emerald and light green for the drummer's uniforms. Amaranth red and dark vermilion for the red and orange parts. And finally, deep yellow and medium flesh tone for the yellow and fleshy areas of the models. I'm going to now apply my first coat of these paints, and I am using Vallejo paints and not my usual cheap artist loft paints, because I do need a consistent paint scheme across all of these models. <laughs> so I apologize as far as cost goes, but it is important when batch painting to be consistent. So Royal Blue goes on first as the sort of base color of most characters' uniforms. The only difference is the drummers who are wearing green rather than blue uh, uniforms. If these were light infantry, I'd be applying blue to the trousers as well, because they're line infantry and they have white or grey trousers. I'm just going in with the royal blue on the coats. This is the same for the command stand. I'm going to highlight the command stand separate from the center and flank company stands, because although the center and flank company stands are normally very similar, the command stand features the officer and the drummers, who have very different uniforms from the rest. The fanion bearer, well, that's mostly the same as a flank company uniform, but... 
Going on next with a combination of Vallejo Black and White to make a sort of darkish gray, and I'm applying that over all the areas that will be white later. This is going to be the undercoat that'll make the later white pop and also give a little bit of texture, like there's some wrinkles in the pants and there's some difference between, for example, the cross belts and the white facings underneath. This same white color can go on the surfaces of the drums, as well as on the facings of any of the uniforms of the command stand, and again on their trousers. I'm applying all of these paints with a fairly broad brush, at least by reference to the 15mm uh, scale, and I'm going on really rough and ready and very quick. Again, the idea here is to be painting these models relatively quickly, um, while still getting a reasonably detailed result. But the detail is going to come in in the second coat later on after we apply a wash. Vallejo Black here goes on for the boots and also the shakos in particular. Be moderately careful while applying this color if you do choose to follow along with this tutorial, because the black will cover up anything else adjacent to it very, very effectively. That being said, I am going to apply a black wash after the application of the entire first coat, so a little bit of overflow doesn't do too much damage to the overall paint scheme. The belt, scabbard, and cartridge pouch are also black, so you can hit those while you're going through at this stage. Next up is Vallejo's Camouflage Medium Brown, which is going on to all the brown areas, notably the musket stocks and the cowhide backpacks that come with the French uniform. Applying this pretty liberally on all those areas works just fine, and we're going to be going in again later to deepen the color after the black wash. On the command stand side of things, we've got the staff for the eagle needs to be made of wood, as well as the backpacks for the two drummers and the outsides of their drums. You can also touch the drumsticks as well, this is kind of difficult to do and it may disappear after the wash so you may just want to wait until after the wash is applied. Next up with a red heavy combination of Vallejo's medium flesh tone and dark vermilion, I'm going to go in and hit all of the flesh areas on the models. This is done again quite liberally. I'm not trying to get all of my details yet, I'm just trying to cover up all of the areas with their base color so that afterwards the wash can darken the recesses and I can go in with my second coat to make the elevated areas pop, especially on the faces where we'll be able to add a little bit of detail by just using a relatively fine brush and touching specific areas. Next up, with the medium flesh tone on my palette, I'm going to go in and I'm going to just base coat all of the areas that are going to be yellow later, notably the epaulettes of the Voltigeur, that is the light flank company, as well as their plumes. These areas are going to have to become yellow later and they're relatively large areas, so I want there to be a base color that'll help the yellow build up over top of it. Just applying yellow right now would kind of work, but by giving a deeper color underneath it, I find we get a nicer yellow after the wash and the second coat is applied. I next paint the plume of the officer blue to represent to them being a lieutenant from the second company. Then I'm going to go with amaranth red for four fusiliers from the third company. Then a royal purple for four fusiliers of the fourth company. I'm separating everything into groups of four fusiliers per company because that's just the organization that fits on the bases and it stretches the units pretty far when we turn all of these models into battalions. Next up, Lime green for the Fusiliers of the first company. And fusiliers are just the infantrymen who are part of the normal center companies. So these center companies, they have plumes whose colors are determined by their position within the battalion. My source for these colors is in the description. Finally, we have the Grenadiers who get Dark Vermilion for their plumes. And I'm going to take that Dark Vermilion and I'm going to go back through all of the companies and I'm going to start working on the trim of the uniform. Because the Bardin uniform is primarily blue with white facings, but does have quite a lot of red trim. So having gotten to the Grenadiers, whose plumes are red, it's time to circle back around and start adding that red everywhere else. You'll note here as well the broad shoulder pads of these flank companies, same as the Voltigeur, who also have broad shoulder pads, only theirs are yellow representing their company color, just as the Grenadiers are red. In all cases, the cuffs are red, as well as some trim around the facings, both on the front of the uniform and on the rear where they are folded back. The Voltigeur also have a funky multicolored plume, so I'm just going to do that now as well, with a little bit of red on top, then green, then yellow. It's a very, very small detail to do on these little models, but it does look really cool when you look up close and see it. So, I uh, figured that was detail that was worth doing and doesn't take that much extra time either. You could also do those plumes at a time where you're not trying to do all of the facings and details, just insofar as it might save you from bouncing back and forth with your paintbrush and getting multiple colors, when you could otherwise be working on the assembly line sort of process. But in my case, I only remember to do the detailed plume when I come around to do the red part on it. 
I fear that if I added the red and then came back later with the green, I would forget to do the green because the plume would look finished enough with the red tip on it. So, I just figured I'd do it all then. The Fanion Bear is also dressed up as a grenadier, so he has large epaulets uh, in red and a red plume. And the drummers also have red plumes and red uh, details on their uniforms. The green of the drummers' uniforms is the last thing we're going to work on because I didn't have any use for green on anything else really except for the lime green for the plumes but uh, I don't want to start with lime green I want to start with an emerald green on the drummer's uniforms so that we have a very dark base from which to build up with the lime green later on so once all of the plumes and facings and details have been done in red come in with the emerald green and just lay down that base coat onto the drummers the facing front part of their uniform isn't white just like everyone else's it appears to be green in the uniform plates that i was looking at and then you're going to do buttons later on to add some detail so fill that in as well now it's time to apply a wash to the models my wash is a homemade wash it consists of black india ink water and a small amount of vallejo airbrush flow improver just to improve the sort of surface tension and consistency of the wash so it spreads more evenly across the model. I apply this with a thick brush. This is just an old Citadel glaze brush that I ended up cutting the tip off of because I think I used it for glue or something. So it's very broad bristled, not precise at all, but uh, charges up with a fairly decent amount of liquid, in this case wash, and applies it pretty liberally as well. I'm applying this very heavily because I want it to get into all the recesses and I want to make sure everything's shaded down. That's going to take some time to dry, so in order to save work time, while that's drying, I'm going to move back over to the bases and I'm going to apply Artist's Loft Raw Umber. This is just the brown from Artist's Loft. Artist's Loft is a craft paint brand from Michael's, a craft store in Canada, and I believe the United States. So hopefully you can find this, or you can find some similar craft paint here. It really doesn't matter too much. I have a lot of this brown, so I'm going to keep some color consistency across the bases. And also it's very cheap, so I can apply it everywhere. And the fact that it goes on kind of streaky and weird doesn't matter, because it's on bases. For the second coat, it's going to be almost the same thing as the first one, except I'm going to be slightly more precise when I apply my colors. I want to give the impression of creases, for example, in the sleeves and on the back of the uniform by leaving areas of darkened, washed paint from the previous coat while applying, in most cases, the same color over top. On such small models as this, the sort of high contrast between the bright unwashed color and the dark washed color from the first coat is really, really appealing because we need these details to pop out from quite a distance from a very small surface, and trying to do some sort of more finessed um, gradients might look pretty nice, but also it would take quite a long time, and that doesn't work so well for batch painting large numbers of these. This blue goes on all the uniforms, it also goes on the rim of the drums for the drummers. So you can just go around the rim there and, uh, you know, slap it onto that raised area. The next color to highlight here is white. Now, when highlighting the white, I'm not going to be mixing with black as I did before. I want it to be that pure bright white to get the maximum amount of contrast on these models. I'm also going to paint the hands of the officer white here to represent little white gloves. I saw these on one of the uniform plates and I thought they looked really dapper and made the officers stand out quite a lot. The areas to highlight here are the cross belts, the facings, the turn backs, and especially the trousers of the models themselves. The trousers are a great place to apply that exact same idea of painting in sort of streaks or leaving dark areas in between so we get some sort of relief on those trousers and make it look like the character is marching forwards. On all of the turnbacks, we also want to try to get a very smooth, large area of white as much as possible, because we're going to be going in later to apply red trim to a lot of the facings and turnbacks, so we want some area of white to show around the red. And I don't want to have to work with, you know, a sewing needle to apply a small enough piece of trim to allow the white to still show through. The idea here is to be quick while still showing a lot of detail, so I'm working in broad strokes, but I'm trying to do it in a thoughtful way that still allows shading and contrast wherever possible. For example, on the facings here of the characters with their cross belts, I'm picking out a X of white, leaving a sort of dark area on either side of one of the belts so that it looks like that belt is behind the other, and then I'm putting in little dots on all the other sides to imply a facing behind it that is also white. Now I come back with light green and apply it to the coats of the drummers, highlighting it in the same way as I highlighted the coats of the others with royal blue, just to make that green area pop a little bit more. Now I grab my dark vermilion again, and before going on to work on the piping and the cuffs and such, I'm going to go on to the grenadiers and apply the braided piping around the tops of their shakos. 
This particular Vallejo paint goes on quite nicely, so with a little bit of care, I can get it to get good coverage over top of the black in a single coat like this. If you are having any troubles, you can put on a coat before putting on the wash, but I try to keep all the details to the second coat just for, again, time-saving purposes. If I'm doing all of the fiddly little details twice, then this is a whole project takes much longer than it necessarily should. The same piping goes onto the shackos of the drummers and of the eagle bearer, since all of them have that same grenadier styled headdress going on. The sides of the headdress on these Magister Militum models actually have lines for you to paint along for the piping that goes down the sides, or the braid that is, so that makes it quite easy. Grabbing my deep yellow, I now go on to the areas on the Voltigeur that need to be picked out in brighter yellow, that is to say their epaulets in particular, and the bits on their plumes that are yellow. For the piping on the shackos here, mixing it with a little bit of the medium flesh tone will thicken it up a little bit and you can apply it on as long as you apply it thickly directly over top of the black. Again, if I did this twice, I might get slightly better coverage, but with the black wash going on over top anyway, I found it didn't make a huge difference, so I just do all of the details in the second coat. Now with that dark vermilion, I just go and apply small amounts to the center of any areas that are supposed to be red, such as the cuffs, for example, and that were darkened down by the wash. By applying it like this, it makes them pop a little bit while retaining a little bit of a shaded appearance around the edges. I'm going to use this same red to go in and apply a little bit of piping on the edges of the turnbacks, and I'll be doing the same to the facings of the uniforms. So just a little bit of a line down the sides of the facings in order to imply that there is piping hidden underneath the cross belts. On the command stand, the officer's tunic has completely exposed facings and very clear turnbacks, so this is a little area where it pays to take a little bit more time in order to get nice piping around the edges of those. Same thing goes for the Fanion Bearer, who gets the red piping around his cross belt, and then we have some nice colorful detail on these models that'll really make them pop on the tabletop. Camouflage Medium Brown now, just the exact same thing, applied over all of the brown areas. Again, I'm trying to sort of touch things more lightly, stick to central areas, in order to imply shadow around the edges where the wash had collected. But by just using the exact same camouflage medium brown, I get a little bit of a gradient and a little bit more dynamic color on those areas. On the backpacks in particular, I try to put this next coat of brown into the center of each of the four quadrants. Since I'm going to be painting on some line holding the pack together afterwards, that implies that the line is pulling things tightly around it and that there is still some shading in the sort of center plus shaped area of the backpack as a result. Now I get a mixture of black and white into a light gray, and I'm going to be using this light gray for a lot of small details on the miniatures. First off, I go in for the drums and apply the detail around the outside, as well as on the actual face of the drum. And then I go in and apply that plus-shaped lacing on the backpacks. I'm going to do this for the actual fusiliers as well as for the drummers. And on the fusiliers, as you just saw, I'm doing the slings for their muskets in that light grey, as well as the straps for their backpacks. I'm also going to add just a little bit of an edge highlight around the cartridge box and around the edges of the shackos of any of the fusiliers. Since they don't have any piping there, the shackos end up looking quite black and just blending together with the hair and stuff, so by adding a little bit of an edge highlight, I find it makes their hats pop a little bit more. Now I mix up the medium flesh tone and dark vermilion once again, but I go a little bit heavier on the medium flesh tone this time to make the mixture a little lighter than it was the first time around on the flesh areas. And I just go in to highlight raised areas. That's the cheeks, the bridge of the nose, the chin, the knuckles, and the raised areas of the hand. This gives a little bit of a dynamic skin look to the models. Sometimes the wash collects around the mustache and makes sure that the mustache is black, such as on these figures you can kind of see it, it's darker there and you really do get the impression of that uniform mustache. On other models that isn't quite the case, but trying to go in with black now and paint a tiny mustache on these figures is generally a recipe for disaster. So instead I just make sure that the highlighting goes around that and the mustache remains darker than the rest of the face and is still implied. This kind of relief makes the faces quite characterful at tabletop distance even for small miniatures like this. Finally with the artist's loft brown paint, I go in over the bases to just make sure that they're pre-blended and will look very good when applied onto their bases. 
Now I apply a matte varnish to the miniatures, and then I go in with metallics, starting with bronze. I need to apply the matte varnish before I go into the metallics, because a matte varnish would rob the metallics of their shine, which would make them not metallic, and therefore totally belie the point. The bronze is now applied to the shako plates, as well as to the grips of the sabers at their hips. This goes for all of the fusiliers, grenadiers, and volsjeurs of all of the normal companies. And for the command company, we apply it to the eagle atop the staff, to the guard of the officer's saber, and again to the shako plates of each of them. This bronze color normally works just fine without standing out too much, but you may want to mix in a little bit of gold paint if you find it isn't bright enough. On the officer, the epaulettes are also gold, as well as I pick out a couple of buttons on his coat just to make them pop. And on the drummer, I want to imply some braiding on the arms, so I apply some stripes, as well as some buttons on the actual facings of the uniform, so I put a little bit of bronze there as well. The second metallic paint I use on these models is gunmetal. I find silver to be a bit too shiny, even for the sword. So I apply this gunmetal to any of the areas that would be silvered, such as the gorget of the officer, his saber, and on the actual barrels of the troops' muskets and their bayonets. All these areas just get a little bit of gunmetal all around. I try to pick out some of the barrel rings for the muskets as well, just to add a little bit of detail, break up the color, etc. And go all the way around the bayonets. You'll see that the highlighting I did at priming, turning everything a little bit gray, means that if we do miss some areas with the gunmetal, it's not a huge deal, they look pretty much the same. Finally, actually basing up the miniatures, I'm going to take them all carefully off of their painting stands, the blue tack releases them fairly easily, and keep them by company so that I know I'm basing everyone in the correct company and I'm not going to have some plumes mixed up or something like that. Then I'm going to grab all of the bases and I'm going to grab some super glue. Just uh, my usual Gorilla Gel super glue. This is a thick super glue, which is very helpful in this situation uh, because it'll help our miniatures stand up a little bit when we apply them on. So I apply big globs of this, be very generous in order to get some tackiness right off the bat, because otherwise uh, they'll wobble around a little bit and they'll be quite hard to balance. I'm also going to need to balance the actual painting stand a little bit, because when I put all of the models onto one side of it, the, all this lead imbalances it and it does want to tip over. So this is a bit of a flimsy setup, but it works fine. Once they're all glued in place, I can touch up any areas that are too shiny with a little more of the artist's loft paint. And then grabbing some matte Mod Podge, and it does have to be matte Mod Podge in this case because I need it to dry matte, otherwise it's really going to stand out, because I don't want to hit these with a matte varnish again, otherwise I would ruin that metallic sheen as I mentioned earlier. So matte Mod Podge applied all around the edges of these bases underneath the troops, and then I sprinkle on some 2mm flock to just give a short, grassy appearance to the bases. I've put a little bit of brown paint around the edges of the bases so they blend in okay with the tabletop, and there we go. That is one battalion of line infantry ready to join Old Boney and La Grande Armée. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, this painting process is fairly quick for me, but also fairly slow because there's so many models to paint, if that makes any sense. Um, but it turns out a very, very nice paint scheme that looks great en masse on the tabletop. I hope this has been very interesting to those of you who joined this channel around the time of me painting 15mm historicals last, which I think was the Spartans and Athenians. Uh, if you'd like to see more of this Napoleonic French project, I do have many more Napoleonic French models, as I mentioned, on the go as part of this large commission. So, if this is something that would interest you, let me know, and uh, I'm sure I can line up some more Napoleonics to paint for the channel. If you've got any questions, comments, concerns, leave them down in the comment section below. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and as usual, go play some games.